Tonight, we look at the story that has been told about the murder of John Benet Ramsey and why so many think her parents guilty and what this tells us about the America she so briefly lived in. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 28 in the 50-part series dealing with the John Bonet Ramsey case. In this episode, we're looking at the former housekeeper Linda Hoffman Pugh's story in and sort of how it changed, where she initially sued the district attorney to allow her to talk about actually write about the experience during the grand jury trial. She also sued the Ramses based on what they said about her in her book and uh, as far as I know sued them unsuccessfully. She then tried to write a book. Um, I'm not sure if the title was going to be Someone is Getting Away with Murder but that's certainly the title of the blog post where the first chapter appears and we're going to be dealing with that in the Patreon section of this episode. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do. You can click on the blue icon on the bottom right of your screen. Like, share, leave a comment. And let's get started. So I must say 24 years later, it is kind of sad to look back at this particular aspect of the case. It's unfortunate that the housekeeper didn't end up writing a book or didn't finish the book that she was writing because that would certainly have been a huge uh, addition to the canon that is out there. And, you know, we could have gotten a heck of a lot of insight out of a proper archive. To be honest, I don't know exactly why that didn't happen. I don't know why the housekeeper didn't continue writing. Uh, believe it or not, I have actually made contact with the housekeeper, but through a third party. I'm not going to talk too much about that here, but I do think it's very unfortunate that that didn't happen. On the other hand, it does look like what did happen was that Linda Hoffman Pugh got kind of in touch with Donna Hoffman. We've spoken about him before, and through the housekeeper's dealings with Donna Hoffman, I think that is how the Bonita papers came to light. And so you kind of have this strange scenario where the housekeeper was going to write a book and provided Donna Hoffman, I guess, with some information. He had some information. And then Bonita Sauer ended up writing um, or trying to write a book. Um, she also didn't succeed, unfortunately, but she did end up writing quite a lot before what she did write was sort of sold to the tabloids. So just b- in both those areas, Linda Hoffman Pugh's uh, narrative and also the Benita Sauer narrative, it's, it's really unfortunate that that those didn't really see the light of day. So in this narrative, I'm really going to just take you through the saga, how Linda Hoffman Pugh kind of changed her story, changed her position in terms of the Ramses, and then also how she kind of, what she said and what appeared in the media about the grand jury trial. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail. So on August the 11th, 2000, And I think this wasn't very long after the Ramses wrote a book. Linda Hoffman Pugh wanted to sue the district attorney. Now, I think what happened was Linda Hoffman Pugh was sort of behaving well, if you want to put it that way. She was sort of staying in her lane. And when the Ramses published their book, she realized that they had kind of identified her as a a likely suspect right in the beginning and you know if you actually go to the police reports Linda Hoffman Pugh's basically identified absolutely immediately I think it the the first suspect was Linda Hoffman Pugh and I think the second was 
It could have been Jeff Merrick. And obviously those suspicions went nowhere. But I, d I don't know if Linda Hoffman Pugh was aware that the police were coming to her house because the Ramses had suggested her as a witness or as a, sorry, as a suspect. But if she wasn't sure, it became clear in their book. And it also kind of makes you wonder, didn't the Ramses talk to Linda Hoffman Pugh about what had happened and vice versa? And you kind of get a sense that perhaps they stopped talking to one another very early on. In any event, after the publication of their book, Linda Hoffman Pugh was sort of ready to sort of wrangle. And so she wanted to start off by filing suit uh, against the Boulder District Attorney, Alex Hunter. And what she wanted to do was lift the secrecy rules involving her testimony. Now, just think about the situation she was in. And it's made explicitly clear in her narrative, the little bit that she wrote down in the first chapter, where she talks about... She's the only woman in the world besides the Ramses who knows who killed John Bonet and she needs to scream it out. She wants to scream. Everybody's asking who killed John Bonet, who killed John Bonet. And she's really the only person in the, in the whole wide world who knows the answer to that question and it's sort of driving her crazy. And there's a aspect to that that kind of rings true in a, in a kind of a lurid way, if you know what I mean, where... If you just think about this media barrage and everybody asking questions and then, yeah, you do have this insider and she's desperate to tell her story. Everyone is thinking about the case, talking about the case, um, you know, trying to investigate the case or whatever it is. And yes, she is, but she's not allowed to say anything. And why? Because she was a witness in the grand jury trial and of course, they are sworn to secrecy and it's driving her crazy. And so when the book comes out, she sort of feels, wow, this is unfair. They've written their story. Not only that, they've accused me and people think I'm a suspect. Well, I want to tell my story, but I'm not allowed to tell my story. And so she sued the district attorney, Alex Hunter, in order to lift the secrecy rules involving her testimony. And... That was quite surprising. Um, it, she filed a lawsuit in the Denver District Court. And in it, she said that she wanted to write a book about the Ramses. And so she was quite explicit about her intentions. At the time, she was represented by New York attorney Donna Hoffman. And he was someone who was working pro bono for the Boulder Cops. And he obviously also had a lot of inside information into this. There are some very interesting exchanges between Donna Hoffman and Lynn Wood, which give you an idea of how it was sort of, um, you know, fighting with the gloves off kind of thing between these two attorneys. And um, what she planned to do was include her testimony before the grand jury and can you imagine if that book had seen the light of day it would have been quite amazing it would have been quite amazing just to get her side of the story the grand jury ended on october 1999 and in this article it says without an indictment or a report right so by august 11th 2000 the public were still under the impression, the media also were under the impression, journalists were also under the impression that there was no indictment, but actually there was. And all the more reason that the story don't st didn't see the light of day, all the more reason that you just bury the grand jury story and move on, especially for the people named in that indictment. And so Hoffman Pugh said in her lawsuit that she was worried that if she publishes questions addressed to her for the grand jury, Hunter would prosecute her. Just think about what we're talking about here is you have the Ramsey case and Hunter's saying, no, well, we don't have enough evidence. We're not going to take it to trial, even though there'd been this huge investigation, even though it was this huge cloud hanging over Boulder for two or three years 
and arguably is still hanging over Boulder 24 years later. It's still making the news. It's still something that people are thinking about and worrying about. And if it wasn't the case, I wouldn't be able to make 50 YouTube videos and, and no one would be bothering to watch them. The fact that people are shows you that it's still lingering in the sort of the zeitgeist. And I do think that the the injustice in terms of the Ramsey case, the, the whole sort of the way that the, the case fizzled and you could call it a cold case or whatever you want to do, I think that is a symptom of where America was going kind of towards the year 2000. And I don't think it's an accident that America is where it is now, 20 years later. I think the Ramsey case was a case that kind of was a blueprint for how to dodge account accountability. If you shout your message loud and often, and if you repeat the same kind of PR spin, that becomes the truth. And I think that is something that has been taken on by a lot of different people. And it's definitely powerful. It's definitely powerful um, counter narrative tr to, to, the, to reality. And we're living in a world where lots of people live in different realities. And in the Ramsey case, that, that reality boils down to did an intruder break in? And is this, um, did what happened, was it the result of an intruder? Or was it some member of the Ramsey family or all the members of the Ramsey family, the surviving members, was it some kind of cover up? And so you have these two um, narratives that, that are diametrically opposed to one another, but only one of them can be true. And so the, the, what eventually happens is one narrative gets emphasized and reinforced and so on, and a lot of it online. And then in the mind of the public, the court of public opinion, one narrative begins to uh, supersede the other. And the whole thing with the Linda Hoffman Pew story is just one example of how the narrative that, that should have come out just fizzles away. And you've sort of got to wonder why. You know, then you have other narratives that come out and they are sued into silence. In any event, if we go back to Linda Hoffman Pugh, she was afraid that Hunter would prosecute her. And this is the irony that I was trying to illustrate earlier is that can you imagine a situation where um, the Ramses don't go to trial, right? There's no proper criminal trial. Um, or the, 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 the John Bonet Ramsey case doesn't go to trial. The the killer, the the how can I put it, the the trial to find her her killer doesn't materialize, but then the district attorney takes the housekeeper to trial for talking about it. I'm just saying, if you think about that, it's absurd, isn't it? In the one case, someone has murdered a child, but you don't want to take that to trial. In another, you want to talk about what you know, but no, 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 we're going to take you to trial. I'm just saying... That's quite, a, quite an odd juxtaposition of legal positions. So ultimately, Linda Hoffman Pugh was asking the court to declare that the secrecy law um, violates her First Amendment rights to free speech. Uh, she wanted the court to prevent Hunter from attempting to enforce penalties for publishing the material. And I can't imagine that Linda Hoffman Pugh made this motion if she hadn't already heard from Hunter, if she hadn't, I'm speculating of course, but it seems, you know, um, as though somebody knew that if she took this step, that Hunter would intervene. And so, so this was kind of um, anticipating that, right? She also wanted to order the district attorney to turn over a transcript of her testimony before the grand jury. That's quite interesting. And um, I don't know whether that actually happened, but it would be interesting to know whether it did happen. And then finally, she wanted attorney's fees and other relief as deemed by the court. At the time, the Boulder First Assistant District Attorney, Bill Wise, said that Hunter um, hadn't actually been served notice of the lawsuit. It's almost like Hunter was totally unaware of it. And 
then uh, Bill Wise said that the assistant county attorney, Andrew McDonald, would handle the case. And, of course, he declined to comment because, of course, he'd also not seen the suit. So, so then there's also Adams County District Attorney Bob Grant, who'd served previously as an advisor to Hunter, uh, spoke about at the time in August 2001, spoke about, sorry, August 2000. Is that, yeah, August 2000. Uh, he spoke about valid legal, historical, and practical purposes for the grand jury secrecy rule. And he was saying, you know, I hope that the civil court wouldn't undermine these valid purposes. Now, you can also think about it in another way. Wouldn't it be in the public interest to know what the housekeeper knew in this case? You know, what harm could it do? The other thing that I think you want to talk about is look at how many other people had written books about the case that also testified in the grand jury trial. I think you could make the argument that perhaps they wrote their books before it concluded or you could make some other argument or it wouldn't necessarily need to reference the grand jury trial. But the point is, um, you know, Steve Thomas testified, he wrote a book. The Ramses both testified, they wrote a book um, and so on. So actually, I'm not 100% sure if the Ramses did testify. That's actually an interesting question, and if, you, if the question is no, that neither of the Ramses testified at the grand jury trial, that in itself raises some interesting questions, doesn't it? It's interesting the kind of questions that come up when you just sort of review the narrative, but there is an article, and I'll put it in the description. It's dated March 2nd, 1999, and it is that the Ramses likely won't testify for grand jury. And I think what that indicates is that the grand jury is kind of targeting them, that they are the center of the grand jury trial. Who else would it be? And I mean, why else would they not testify if it wasn't something that was specific to them? I mean, they were the key, they, they were the most key witnesses in this incident, weren't they? Former FBI profiler Greg McCrary, this is basically John Douglas's counterpart, he called the decision whether to compel or not to compel the Ramsey's testimony a kind of a legal chess game. And, and this is a quote from the Daily Camera. He said, quote, If you've got hours and hours of videotape, do you just want to show the grand jury that? McCrary asked, referring to the 40-plus hours of taped interviews from last June. Or do you want to show the grand jury that and then bring the Ramses in and try to expose some inconsistencies? Then there's also a reference to University of Florida criminal procedure professor Gerald Israel. Wow, I've just seen a mouse walking past my window. Interesting. Okay. Um, and he was saying that the purpose of a grand jury investigation is not necessarily to indict someone. Well, that was, I think, the purpose of this one, and that was the result of this one. Anyway, to go on, he says, quote, if a target really has some sort of explanation that would exonerate him, you want to know that up front. Sorry, that is actually, sorry, this mouse has totally distracted my attention wandering through this creeper next to my window. Sorry, that was actually a quote from Jefferson County Senior Deputy District Attorney Dennis Hall. Um, the University of Florida criminal procedure professor Gerald Israel said, yeah, a target can testify. And then he says, quote, but usually they take the privilege against self-incrimination, end quote. I think that's quite interesting. But let's get back to Linda Hoffman Pugh. Now, in this article, and I'll put a link to the article in the description, it refers to her working for the Ramses for 14 months. It's quite a long time. It's longer than a year, and she was obviously employed by them at the time of the incident and also at the time of that interesting Christmas party on the 23rd. I think she was supposed to come in on the next day, the 24th. It's unfortunate that she didn't. But she was apparently, I think, not feeling well. 
She was questioned about John Bonnet's death and gave police blood, hair, and handwriting samples, according to this article. Uh, it says here that no suspects have ever been named in the case, but the authorities said that the parents remain under suspicion. Those authorities are obviously the Boulder police. Um, obviously, there were suspects, but they were never named, which I think is quite interesting. Linda Hoffman Pugh may not have known that she was a suspect in terms of the public domain, but she was certainly a suspect from the Ramsey's perspective and handed over to the police to in investigate. I'm saying that that information was handed over. Um, sh they also investigated her husband. The Ramseys have denied any involvement. And then it refers to Lynn Wood saying that um, Pew's book about the family would be less than flattering. So I think that's quite interesting is that the Ramsey's attorney is already wary of, of a book being written about his clients. And, you know, if you think about it, do you think, if you just think about it in a basic way, the housekeeper saying less than flattering things about the family is already casting the family in a different light. And it's kind of interesting that Linwood sort of acknowledges this. And then this is a quote from him. He says, although what he would say about them would be less than flattering. I mean, what is she supposed to do? Flatter them? Say everything is perfect or whatever. Anyway, he goes on to say, quote, but there's nothing that Linda Hoffman Pugh can say about this family that's going to hurt them much more than anything else that someone has said. And then he said something about he believes that the grand jury, which her testimony over 13 months, should be allowed to weigh in. Interesting. And then he goes on to say the whole truth should be disclosed to the public. Now, I think what Linwood is trying to do here could be wrong. I'm just trying to understand his reasoning. It's almost like he's trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't know if that's an appropriate um, aphorism for this, but what I mean is Linda Hoffman Pugh wants to sort of put up her hand and say, hey, can I, can I be excluded from this, this veil of secrecy in terms of the grand jury, just me, right? And Lynn Wood is saying, you know what, if she's excluded, I think everyone should, I think the, the veil over the whole thing should be lifted. And I think Lynn Wood would know that that, that wasn't going to happen, that there's no way that they were going to do that, especially given the result of the indictments, right? The secret result of the indictments. And so Wood's argument was the whole truth should be disclosed to the public. And John and Patsy feel the same way. Now, if you just play devil's advocate there and you sort of, let's say you could, let's say you were the district attorney and you could flick a switch. Can you imagine what would have happened if the whole truth was disclosed? Do you think Pat, John and Patsy would feel comfortable with the, the news being put out there that the indictments were what they were and they, and they simply just weren't signed? So I think the more interesting question here is, did John and Patsy know then what was in those indictments and also who else knew? And that's something maybe a criminal defense lawyer would know. You know, to what extent would you have the discovery at your disposal? It's hard to imagine that you wouldn't have it at your disposal because, you know, you are entitled, legally entitled to defend yourself. And, you know, in the Chris Watts case, he obviously had access to all of the uh, discovery. And it's something I wrote about in my book, Silver Fox Post Truth, is to what extent some of the ideas and concepts and discussions about what he may have done if he read them himself, may have informed his own version of events subsequent to his first confession. Does that make sense? In other words, by having access to the discovery, he learns what other people are saying about him, think about the situation, and of course, he knows more than anyone else knows. 
And so one wonders the same about this in terms of the Ramses. So if you're going to make a statement like this, um, you know, we want the whole truth out there, it certainly makes it seem like the Ramses have got nothing to hide and that, that they are innocent, doesn't it? And so I think it took about a year, it took about a year before the housekeeper was allowed to talk about what had happened. And if you think about it, a lot can happen in a year. The Ramses brought out their book. The Ramses did a book tour. The Ramses set their narrative kind of in stone. The Ramses appeared on CNN. So they had quite a lot of time to, let's say, make hay. And meanwhile, the housekeeper was sort of um, stuck in kind of a legal limbo. And so eventually the federal judge did give the grand jury witnesses permission to talk about their secret testimony. And it looks like it wasn't just the housekeeper. So in the next part of this um, episode on Patreon, I'm going to be talking just briefly about what the housekeeper was quoted as saying to the media. And then we're going to quickly go through her narrative not the whole narrative, but parts of it, and just see what she says that may not have been that flattering, but what really uh, provides some insight into the dynamics of the household according to the housekeeper. So that is available on Patreon on the $2 tier, and you can head to www.patreon.com slash TCRS. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. Linda Hoffman P was quite adamant that she thought 